to the All NBA Show, part of the All City Podcast Network. I'm your host, Adam Mares, and I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Tim Legler. Legs, great night in the association. I have a feeling you're going to cook today. I'm going to cook today. And look, don't get me wrong. I'm excited about this show, but that's not why I dressed up. That's not why I have a shirt <laughs> tie on today. Right? I just came, came from TV. I got to go back to TV, but yeah. I wouldn't miss this show for all the world. But I am very excited, so maybe it's appropriate that I am dressed this way. It probably is appropriate because you've been high on the Mavericks, and I feel like last night they got – I don't, we use statement win. I think I have statement win like once a week. I, I mentioned statement win, but this one feels like a watershed win. It feels like a moment where people are going to start hopping on the Mavericks bandwagon. We're going to talk about that game as well as all of the great games in the association last night. The Warriors did some encouraging stuff. The Bucks had maybe their worst loss of the season. And the Thunder go into New Orleans and get a big time road win uh, to set up a great matchup with Houston tonight. So we're going to talk about all of that and more on today's show. But first, we are presented, as always, by DraftKings Sportsbook. Stay tuned, because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all that has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. All right, let's go to Sacramento, where the Dallas Mavericks get a blowout win, 132-96. to Even if you just, if you didn't watch this game and just look at the box score, some good numbers. A lot of guys scored. No crazy Luka 45, 20, and 10. Nothing like that. And yet it was an absolutely dominant performance from them, Legs. What stood out to you about it? Yeah, I mean, this was this was just getting carved up. That's really what they did. It was a, it was a close game for a half, and then the Mavericks just completely put this thing away in the third quarter. Then it got out of hand in the fourth quarter. Um, but w- when, I, when I'm looking at this game, I thought this was a really important win. And, like, I agree. We use statement win maybe too often, right? Yeah. Uh, I do think – for instance, we're going to talk about these games from last night. Like, I think what the Lakers did, statement, I think this is more of a signature win. That's how I okay. would describe it. Like, this is, this is you know, a little bit more. You, you know, you put this one, you get a little trophy for this win, this goes on a little bit of a higher shelf, okay? Okay. And, and some, some of the other ones you've had. That's the way I would look at this because, look, the Kings, Kings, they're, you know, they're a factor in the Western Conference. And you come in yeah. and you've got all your guys going. And they completely were unaffected by anything Sacramento did to them, and, and particularly Luca. And I'm just still amazed by when I watch him play. You and I were talking before the show, and I just said, I just don't think I've ever seen a player handle the ball as casually as he appears to be with that much pressure in his space. <laughs> and he just doesn't care who's in front of him. He goes where he wants to go. He's got such a purpose with exactly the spot on the floor he wants to get to. I love the fact that Luca comes out every night and tries to basically put numbers on the board in the first six minutes. I love it. I hate when you get these yeah. players that come out and they're like kind of passive for a few minutes and got yeah, a feel for the it. game. Are you kidding me? Luca never does that. He comes out every night and he wants to just go at you and, and put a couple buckets on the board and get yeah. himself going. And then he'll then he'll distribute more. You know, that, that maybe that second stint that he's in, and then he'll just take over in the second half as a score whenever he needs to. That looked easy last night. His numbers weren't those eye-popping numbers, but still, you know, he and Kyrie combined 20 for 37, like super efficient night. Um, they combined for 14 assists, 14 rebounds. They just controlled the game, and the, and the opportunities where Luka didn't have it or he was out of the game, Kyrie was, was sensational. He was yeah. electric in the, how he needed to be. And then, you know, as you know, just looking at the way these other pieces fit, it's like a perfect puzzle right now. Yes. Um, everybody is has it. got a role and a lane, and they bring something that's important to this team, and they're doing it every night, all built around this unstoppable <clears throat> offensive force that Luka is. Yeah, and that's why I opened it up the way that I did, because Luka could have 40 points, and it, that covers some of your weaknesses or sins or whatever, and it's like, great, your superstar led you to a victory. Last night, he played great. Kyrie played great, but to me, it's the story of the Mavs, as we've watched them over the last couple of weeks, 
the story of the Mavs is that their identity is now coming into focus. They had some injuries. They made the trade. They've had their ups and downs throughout the course of the season where you saw little flashes of it. But I feel like over this last week and a half, two weeks, and really it goes before that, but they've gotten healthy over the last week or two weeks. Since that time, you see the vision. They have a very clear identity and what they are trying to do down the court every single time. And that is you have Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving and you have 10 guys in your rotation that can screen for those guys in pick and roll and they give different looks. And what that does is it creates your defense. You're always going to have your weakest defenders in pick and roll action and you're going to have multiple ways. Is it pick and roll with Derek Jones? Is he rolling to the rim? Is he short rolling? Is it lively rolling to the rim? Is it Exum short rolling? Every time they run a pick and roll, no matter if it's one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, no matter what it is, they get some kind of dynamic option out of it. And they all seem to know how to read those various options. So now you could run the same plays with different action to different people. And you're just giving different looks for 48 minutes. And it's so hard to guard. That's a, that's such a great point. That's so astute because I don't think there's a team that's more predictable in how they're going to operate than the Dallas Mavericks. I'm sorry. If Luka Doncic yeah. is on the court, Luka Doncic has the ball every single trip. It's not like, you know, when occasionally he'll throw it over to Kyrie and like, okay, go ahead. But for the most part, this is Luka's show, and here's what we're going to run, and everybody's going to play off of him, and you know he's going. he's not going to get jammed up to where you know he he dribbles with it too long and then the pressure gets to him in his face and now all of a sudden he's at 35 feet with five seconds on the shot clock no he's not going to do that he's going to get where he needs to go and everybody play off so if that's going to be a high ball screen you got a rim run you got three spot up shooters and then luca go make a play out of it you're going to iso back a guy down into the post well then we're going to make sure we're going to time the slash on the weak side exactly as luca starts to maneuver down to the lane three shooters on the weak side spotted up, ready to go. It's so obvious what's about to happen, but because of Luca, you can do that and get away with it because yeah. he he's going to control the basketball in a way that unlike any player in this league, he gets to his spot. And even if he doesn't, he can go six, eight step back and get something good off, even on those possessions when they didn't go necessarily according to plan. He has that to throw and, and pull out of his bag at the end of a possession. So I agree with you, man. They're, they're just they're right. Last night was machine. Like yeah. it was so, yeah. it was so perfectly orchestrated that there was such certainty with the way they were playing every trip up the floor. It was like, almost like, look, I like Sacramento, but I don't know if you felt this way, but I'm kind of watching that going, wow, like, there's a massive difference between these two teams with the way the Dallas Mavericks look right now and and this, this you know the the cohesion that he and Kyrie have figured out this there's a big difference and a huge separation between these two teams and it's not I know it's one game I get it but I, I don't know these two teams played a seven game series I couldn't see Sacramento winning more than one game well I'm well, they have an interesting schedule right here because they played on Tuesday last night and they play again in Sacramento on Friday so there's three days in between this double header in the same location. And I was thinking about this last night. Dallas probably stays in Sacramento, but with that much time, you could almost fly home and be home for Wednesday, Thursday, and then fly back to Sacramento to play this second game. It's a very weird schedule for both teams. But nonetheless, um, I want to keep hammering this point that you're talking about because they were a machine last night and they have been a machine a lot lately. And it's not like Luke is a better player, Kyrie's a better player, Tim Hardaway's on fire right now. It's not it, those things are are mostly the same what's different now is they have their identity and they know what they're doing and last night to illustrate why i think you're so high on what dallas does you have fox you have ellis and you have keegan murray you think okay we're gonna put ellis and murray on our best defenders they're gonna guard the pick and rolls all these little guard to guard action or whatever but dallas it doesn't matter who you can't hide a defender you can't put somebody off ball because then they'll just run pick and roll with that action so you're going to put your weakest defender on pj washington or derrick jones jr or cleaver or whoever else you're going to try to hide them there just run guard screen or ball screens with those two guys and you have a whole new look off of it if you want to put the low man who's the weakest defender is the low man Dallas has the ability to put him there because they can run that action with all their guys. And to me, that's why in a playoffs, we keep talking about Oklahoma City and these different things about what makes a team a playoff team. What makes them a playoff team is you can force the other team's hand every time down court, no matter what choice they make. And Dallas has the ability to do that.
It's a great point. I, I, I use the analogy. I, I played with some great golfers. I love golf. I'm not a great golfer. I'm good enough to not embarrass myself, but I know some great ones and I've played with some and they always fascinate me because it's kind of like you can pull any club. They can pull any club out of their bag and hit the same shot. Right. Right. If you want, yeah. if you want to yeah. hit, if you want to hit a driver, you want to yeah. smoke a driver 300 yards, they'll, they'll pull out the big boy. And that's Derek Lively, right. With a thunder dunk off the pick and roll on a rim run. You know what? You want to bring PJ Washington? Well, I'll pull out my hybrid yep. and yep. I'll still exactly. be able to hit the ball the same distance. It's just going to, it's going to have a different flight path. Right. Yep. So this is I love this that. is what this is what Luca does. It doesn't matter who you throw out there with him, and to a lesser extent, Kyrie, because Kyrie is not necessarily going to beat you like by making a passing read. He, and he actually, I think a lot of times, he's better off without the ball screen. Kyrie is so good oh, in right, a tight yeah. face with a live handle and just let him go. I always think he's better sometimes without it, but with Luca, just you give him anybody on their roster. Come over, set the screen, and I'm going to figure out the best way to attack this based on what kind of defense I get and what the personnel looks that's that's covering me. And, and I'm going to do one of the plays on the touchscreen I'm going to do today for that for that game. He had a lob to Gafford where he was he kind of came down the right slot in semi transition, but the, the Kings were pretty much back, so it was like an early offense type play. But he came down the right slot. He's dragging two guys with him, and like you could see that he had just the slightest glance. It wasn't even a real full head turn at Gafford, who was like, I don't know, eight, 10 feet behind him. Yeah. But he knew based on if I can get this second defender that's hovering in the lane to bite on me, like one more step, that's going to create just enough of a runway for Gafford to run and catch this lob I'm about to throw, which was basically a one hand scoop. Like he threw up over his head into the lane and he knew that it was going to be there because of what he did to command that second defender and he waited until the exact right time when that defender finally committed it's exactly when he threw the ball and now gafford's got a clear run to the rim and he throws it down and it looks like just another lob from luca but i watched it totally differently and i rewound it and i'm like this guy's genius of his ability to to just control you with his handle his strength and his eyes and then his mind does the rest, and he he's, he just sees everything on the court, and he makes the game so easy for these guys. He threw a behind-the-back pass last night to P.J. Washington off of a high ball screen where he dragged two. And, like, if he if he jumps in the air and, like, throws a, throws a jump pass back over to him, yeah. that takes an extra half a second. Yeah. So instead, as he's coming off, it's just a quick flick behind the back, right back to P.J. Washington who picked him up. And that little extra, you know, eighth of a second is the difference between that defender that closed out on him getting there to bother him and not. So it's Man. little things like that. It's he's just got every single weapon at his disposal in his own game. And yeah. that's what is so unique about him, man. So, I, you know, he, I just he's sensational all the time. Um, but I just thought last night, even though these weren't some of his best numbers, I just thought that was an absolute – you know, rubber stamp, um, Luca game where he basically went in there and marked his territory. Like this is game. Yeah. This is my game, my court. I own this. A hundred percent. I want to get to what you said though about Kyrie Irving because here's how I think he fits into this ecosystem. And by the way, fits very, very nicely into it. Is that with your ability to stack the deck because Luca has a pick and roll partnership with every single player, and and he can do something with no matter who's screening for him. You are often get a lot of scrambles. You get a lot of guys switching and you run pick and roll. You got to recover and switch, switch. He is the best or one of the best in the league at attacking. Okay. All of a sudden a, a four or a five just got switched out onto him or somebody's closing out. Even a good defender's closing out on him. He's as good as anyone at breaking that down. So you think, Oh my God, we got our power forward. We got our center switched onto him, but we're just trying to contain Luca right yeah. now. You just swing the ball over to Kyrie. And all of a sudden it's like, Oh crap. Our center's out on an Island with the quickest shiftiest player in the NBA. So that is where all the, like everybody on this Mavs roster, not a ton of superstars, quote unquote superstars, but they all have something that plays off of Luca's ability to run and pick and roll downstream of that, that takes advantage of it. And Kyrie, obviously the biggest one. Yeah. And they've got, they, they've got depth at these spots. Now they've got depth at these spots yeah. where you trust guys to make plays. And it's obvious, it's just obvious to me in watching Luca that the level of, nightly frustration that he was exhibiting is greatly reduced. Now, some of that might be 
because, you know, hey, he's just a year older and, you know, he's been in the league now since 2018. He's been in the league now for, you know, five, six years. Like maybe he's growing up a little bit and some of that stuff that he would get distracted by so easily isn't as readily available to him. I don't know that it's that. I think it's he knows he's got a squad. This yeah. is the best team Luka Doncic has had. This is the best team. And it doesn't, you know, and you can go back to the conference final team and say, well, what about Brunson? And they had Spencer Dinwiddie on that team. Yeah, you're right. But guess what? As great as Jalen Brunson is with the Knicks, like he wasn't quite that when he was with the Mavericks. He was really, really good. And it turns out, man, that this guy can carry a team. And that's what he's done in New York. But he wasn't quite that. He wasn't quite right. Kyrie Irving, like at his best when he was in Dallas. And Spencer Dinwiddie was an important player on that team. But the pieces that they have now and the nightly yeah. contributions of guys that don't have to step out of their comfort zone, just be who you are, let Lucas set the table for all of you and just do what you do well. And if yeah. we can all collectively increase our defensive intensity by 10 or 15%, this team, and I'm sure in Lucas mind, he thinks they can win the whole thing. There's no question right. that he believes that this year. I, and I do think this is his best chance to this point in his career. This is the best team, the way it's built, the way they fit that he has been on since he's been in the league. The last thing I have on this game, and maybe you have more on the Kings, and this is a little King-centric, but this is the second game in the last week and a half or so that Dallas has gone against a really good scoring big, playmaking big in Sabonis, and then Jokic last week. 12 points, 11 rebounds, 9 assists. Not a bad stat line for Sabonis, but he was killed when they were when he was on the court, or the Kings were killed when he was on the court. What is it, do you think, about Dallas? Because I would guess their vulnerability. To me, their vulnerability is be these bigs that can score on them because their guards, Gafford, Lively, those guys are good guys, but not defensive stalwarts in the post against bigs. So what is it that they have especially been good against that mold here in this run? Yeah, I, look, I think actually, for me, the way that they're able to attack him – is something that bothers Sabonis. I think yeah. th th you think about it, what you're asking him to do athletically against this team is, is, is hard. It's really hard to pull off, to present what you need to present to help Luca and also be agile enough to recover back for these balls that he is throwing to guys on pocket passes or baseline lobs or runners. They're very difficult to do both. And I think for Sabonis, it's hard and it gets him out of his element a little bit. He feels attacked. I think when he plays this team and as a result, he only took 10 shots in the game. Now look, the game got out of hand. So those numbers are a little bit off. The fourth quarter was meaningless in this game. So maybe those numbers will be a little bit different, but I just don't think that the Mavericks look at what the uh, Kings present defensively on their front line as, as enough for what they're going to bring at them at the rim in the paint, the constant relentless pressure that Luca puts on you down there. Yeah. Any other thoughts on the Kings? I mean, I, I am looking forward to this being a rematch on Friday. Again, I don't love that schedule. It's a little bit weird, but I, the Kings look so helpless in this one, and I'm curious. If they have another game that looks exactly like this, I think uh, I think it'd be pretty telling. So I didn't actually – it's a glitch in the schedule. I mean, not a glitch, but, I mean, they've created these now, but I don't think I've seen that. I, I didn't even notice that. So you're saying that they played last night, they don't play on Friday, two nights off. Let me make sure that that is the that is definitely the Mavs' schedule. They don't play until again on Friday at Sacramento, so both games in Sacramento. Let me see if Sacramento. I want to make sure they don't they didn't give them a game. In yeah, between. they play tonight or Thursday by any chance. Nope, nope. So both teams do not play. They played last night and they play each other again in Sacramento on Friday. So very that's, weird that both teams have three days off. That is before first the rematch. Like very bizarre. I don't think that's something <laughs> the league should ever do. I, I just don't yeah. think that's fair to a team that's sitting around playing the same team twice with two full days off that I, look, if that's was, if this was Miami, I don't think those guys would care, <laughs> much, right? but it's, you know, it's not. So, but yeah, you're just kind of sitting Shots around. Fired now, Sacramento. Yeah. Right. Now here's what I will say. Here's what I will say to your point about what to expect on Friday. I actually would like to issue that challenge to the Mavericks more so than the Kings. If you're Dallas, you really want to make a definitive statement about how serious you are right now come out and beat them again by 2025 when they've yeah. had two full days off what well, clearly wasn't their best night they've had two full days plus a third day of walk around to prepare for you specifically and you still come out and carve them up 
you might really just completely demoralize the Kings if you're able to do that again. So let's see if the Mavericks can approach it with that level of seriousness. Equally as important, that game gave uh, Dallas the upper hand now in that 6-7 battle. They fought places after last night. So Dallas a full game ahead of Sacramento, a full game ahead of Phoenix. And by the way, only two games. I know it's a lot, but a game and a half, two, ga- two losses behind now the Clippers for that four seed. So not dead yet. You can keep this win streak going, but but the the big one is staying out of the play in and Dallas with another win on Friday would create some real distance there uh from the rest of the team. So I think it's a big one. Dallas is looking good. You're Luca for MVP bet. You made the prediction. They lost like three in a row. It looked like you were dead in the water, but here they come. Dallas at six seed with an outsider shot at a four seed, which is I think what you're probably just for voters. I'm not saying how I would vote, but voters probably want to see a top four seed if they're gonna make that pick. And it's uh it's alive again. Let's take a break. We got to get to some of these other games. There's so many good games last night. We're gonna move on to the Warriors. It's been a while since we've had an encouraging Warriors game, but I know you were very encouraged with what you saw as they beat the Miami Heat, maybe discouraged by what you saw from the Miami Heat. So we'll do that one on the other shot side. But first, gotta tell you guys about the game time app. It's Wednesday, just a couple days. The weekend is in sight. Friday is in sight. What are your plans for the weekend? Are you going to go watch a game? Are you going to watch a concert? Are you going to check out an event? Well, download the Game Time app. You can get last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals. And also, you can just sort and look for events that are going on in your area. Probably lots of events you didn't even know about. You just check it out and see what the ticket prices is for each every single one. They've got that great feature where you have the all-in pricing on the first page so you don't get surprised when you check out. They also have the ability to look at your seat and see a, a virtual view of what it will look like from whatever seat you purchase so you're not surprised when you show up and the seat is not what you expected. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code ALLNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code ALLNBA for $20 off. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Also want to tell you guys about DraftKings Sportsbook. We are presented by them. We're thrilled and excited with March Mania is here. DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. I'll tell you, my this is my sleeper pick, and Legs is going to hate it. My sleeper pick here, CU to beat Iowa. I'm going in on it. I think they have a chance this year. I know Caitlin Clark is incredible. I think the Buffaloes are pretty incredible as well. So I think the Lady Buffs are going to get this one done. If you want to make that bet, you bet five bucks, even if I'm wrong and I led you astray, you still get $150 instantly in bonus bets. So download, use the code ALLNBA uh, at DraftKings Sportsbook. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Or in West Virginia, visit 1-800-GAMBLER.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.co slash b ball for eligibility and deposit restrictions terms and responsible gaming resources so we had two really close games in the nba last night and yet we're starting with the two blowout games because there's interesting storylines on each of them we're now going to miami where the warriors smack the heat 113 to 92 finally an encouraging performance from the warriors clay thompson starts in this one and gets 28 points what stood out to you about this uh, listen, you know, I know that the Miami Heat, Jimmy Butler was a late scratch. So, you know, you always take it with a grain of salt when you don't have him, but it doesn't matter for the Warriors at this point. You talk it's about awesome. statement wins, good wins. They're all really significant to the Warriors, particularly with what's going on in Houston right now, like right on their heels. They have a huge matchup, the two of them next week. Um, so the Warriors just didn't have an easier schedule in Houston. So you get a game, listen, you get a team on the road and they don't have their best player, then you better go get that win. And they did it. I just thought they were very impressive. They're efficient. When you look at Golden State a lot of nights, they won't do all of these things. They won't shoot efficiently from the field on the same night that they limit their turnovers, on the same night that they don't get killed on the glass, on the same night that they are actually better in transition and they also win the three-point battle. They, they did all of those things. They, they don't really do that they, because they're so inconsistent from night to night with not only their team performance, but individually, who's it coming from tonight? And this was one of those nights when Clay Thompson plays like this, you've got a real chance against anybody because it's just so important yeah. to have that level of offense from that player. 
because he's so important. The ball finds him all the time, and he's just so active. He's going to constantly be hunting shots, and if he's in rhythm, it's a great thing. If he's yeah. not, it can really stall your offense. He played great last night. Curry, uh, they did a pretty good job defensively on him, man. They, they, were, they were executing their jump-out switches, their blitzes. They were getting the ball out of his hand more. He only took 15 shots. He had 17 points. Very pedestrian night for Steph Curry. They still won the game because Clay yeah. was great. Uh, Wiggins was very good in this game. Kuminga was very good in this game. Um, and then they had they had nice contributions off their bench, even though it wasn't scoring. They took care of the ball, and they they made some of those like hustle type plays that help you win games. I, it was an impressive win for the Warriors, no matter who was on the court for the Miami Heat. Um, they need them all, and this was this was big for them to get this because, like I said, Houston is right there over their shoulder, and the Warriors can't afford to fall behind them because they might start to feel a little bit too much pressure. I think as long as they can stay up a game going into that game next week, they already have the tiebreaker whether they win or lose. But if you win that game and then you go to two up on Houston, which means you're really three up on Houston because right. you have the tiebreaker, it's a wrap. It's a wrap. They're not going to get run down from behind. So these few games here in between now and next Thursday are critical, and they took care of business last night. What The balance between Klay Thompson, Gary Payton, and Pajemski is so interesting to me. And last night, Klay Thompson gets the start and plays the lion's share of the minutes. We've been talking about this a lot, about the dynamic of those three guys and where do you go. Last night, they start Klay and they stick with him. I mean, I guess it's because he made some shots early, and that's a big part of it. But – to me, it's interesting to me that they went to Clay here and that he played as much as he did. Look, I think, look, and I don't know, there wasn't, I don't know if Steve Kerr addressed this after the game, but like that wasn't necessarily the plan going in that he was going to start. I think the seat Butler doesn't play, and maybe he's thinking to himself, well, this is a better opportunity. Maybe Clay gets going early because mm. Jimmy Butler won't be on him because he would have been probably the primary defender on him. Instead, you know, you get uh, Terry Rozier or Jaime Hawkins as the primary defender, and that's going to put Clay in a little bit more of a comfort zone to get going. And it's not Caleb Martin who's coming yeah. off the bench. Where if Clay comes off the bench, Caleb Martin probably checks in at that time, and that's a harder right. matchup for Clay Thompson. So whatever right. it was, it, it it was the right button to push right. on a particular night, and and it it got him cooking. And look, Clay is just one of those guys right now. I think you're, you're going to ride like his starts. How does he start in the game? Because this year. He's had a harder time after a slow start turning his night around. You know, it used to be Clay Thompson, and you know, a few years ago, and then throughout his career, he, he could go miss his first four or five shots, and right. you knew what yep. it was going to look like by the end of the game. Like, okay, yep. it's a matter of time. He's going to string together shots because that's what he does, and that hasn't been the case this year, and it wasn't the case last year in in the Lakers series. So that is kind of how it is now. Like, you kind of hope, man. It's like. It's like both my kids were shooters, you know. I caught, and I'm sitting in the stands watching the play, and I just, especially my daughter, she'd get self conscious about missing, and I'd be like, "Oh, please make your first shot," because it like unleashed something in her head. And it's the same right. thing, Clay. Like he he makes shots early in the game, you can just tell his confidence. He just looks different. He's got a different swagger to him because he wears his frustrations on his sleeve to the extent that he does. When he doesn't start off well, I think sometimes that hinders him the rest of the night, and it didn't used to, but it is the case now. So give him credit, man. He, you know, he, he jumped on it, got going, and he was their best offensive player on the night. It is muted for me a little bit because that Miami's so banged up. And so many, and when they don't have their scores, when they're missing multiple of their shooters and scores to me, it's just so hard for them to get any point. So not to take anything away from Golden State, they needed a win any way they got it, and they looked good doing it. But Miami, man, that team, 92 points. And I'm almost surprised when you look at the roster that was available, I'm almost surprised they got to 92. Let's move on to the Lakers and the Bucks, 128 to 124 in overtime. Uh, this is a really last, no LeBron James in this game. Really tough loss for Milwaukee. I thought Anthony Davis was really good in this one. Uh, not just his stat line, 34 and 23, uh, 23, which is incredible. But I thought his defense in this game was really impactful on the Bucks. What stood out to you about it? All right, the first thing that stood out was, all right, we knew LeBron was going to be out. They're calling it ankle management. So he's got this ankle issue, right? Okay. So here's my question for you. If you are someone that's got an ankle injury and you're not expected to play, you don't play, and you're suited up in street clothes on the bench, 
are you as actively standing up as much as LeBron James was during this game? Like I just, <laughs> I'm watching the game, Adam, but Ooh, I'm just cool. okay. And I, I'm just, I'm, look, I'm not yeah. saying, look, I'm not saying, yeah. I'm not saying like the oh, guy yeah, was good enough to play. I'm just saying logically, logically, if yeah. you have an ankle injury that yeah. you're preserving, and that's why you're not playing. Aren't you either sitting down the entire game or you're back like in the locker room? That's all I'm saying. Yeah. LeBron was standing up like the entire fourth quarter of this game. It was just – that stood out to me first. All right, now to the game. All right, here's why this is such an important game for the Lakers. And if you don't, you know, take my word for it that this was an important game, listen to Darvin Ham after the game. He called it the t- top three wins of the year for the Lakers. And surprisingly, they've only had – This is their longest winning streak of the year. It's four games. I mean, this is the kind of year the Lakers have had. It's only (laughs) four, but this kept it going. And the reason he said that was for a lot of reasons. Okay, number one, you don't have LeBron. You're on the road. The Bucs are playing well. The Bucs have addressed some of their problems. They've tightened some of those things up. One. Two, you fell behind not only by 19 in the fourth quarter. You almost got buried in the first quarter. Yeah. And on a night when you don't have LeBron and you're playing the Bucs and you get down big early – you mean teams in this league, that would have been a 35-point game, and it's just it is what it is. Mail it in. Let's move on to the next city and hopefully get LeBron back. No, they didn't. They dug out of the first hole, stayed within, like, arm's length, and then the Bucks hit them with another run, and now they're down 19 in the fourth quarter. And, again, perfect opportunity for this to turn into a 28-point game. It didn't. Right. So the resilience of it matters to me in the moment, the fight to win this game and to get back in the game. Since something, Milwaukee was dangling that led them to believe they could come back and get this game. So that was important. And then finally, just running their offense, making winning plays when the Bucs didn't at the important times in the game, whether it was Austin Reeves, who was played like a star in this game. He's a very good player. Yep. He was a star in this game. Spencer Dinwiddie, sneaky acquisition for them. He was really good in this game. And then, and then Anthony Davis was unbelievable both ends, but particularly defensively, a couple of the plays that he made saved the game. Um, So for me, it's the totality of everything about this performance and then comparing it to some of the issues the Bucs had, which raises questions, I think, about them and kind of keeps it afloat. We know they've been better. They've closed the gap with Boston, but there was some ugliness in that game for them last night that I think is worth talking about. Um, and the Lakers took advantage of all of that. They were the better team in the big moments when they had to have it. And I think it's a momentum thing. It's a feel-good thing. It's a confidence thing. Um, that's why I feel like this was a huge statement game for the Lakers. And and on the other side, a, a really tough one for the Bucks. I want to get to some of the ugly. I want to hear what you found to be so ugly about Milwaukee. But I just want to put this first point out there that these two teams, as constructed last night without LeBron, actually had a lot of similarities. And the similarities are D'Angelo Russell, Austin Reeves, Spencer Dinwiddie, not the greatest one, two, three defensive unit, but they all have the ability to score and make plays. And then you go to the other side, Beasley, Lillard, you know, I've talked a lot about them, ability to shoot, ability to score, but I think they're a horrible defensive backcourt. So who is going to win that matchup? He had more star power on the Lillard side of things. But last night, D'Angelo Russell goes for 29, seven and 12. Austin Reeves goes for 29, 14, and 10. Dominated that matchup. And then when you got to overtimes, the the two overtimes, there were defensive breakdowns on guard-to-guard screen action between Lillard and Beasley, and they just didn't have the ability to stop. Austin Reeves in particular kept getting free for that pick and pop and knocking down shots. And to me, if you're going to buy the Bucs, and by the way, I'm one of these guys. I'm buying the Bucs over here. I I, I like the Bucs out east. If you're buying them, that's the thing that makes you pause is, Austin Reeves and D'Angelo Russell are good backcourt. They're not the best backcourt you're going to see. And they carved him up last night. That's concerning. No, it, very. And look, some of these are just absolute classic just breakdowns. How how are you allowing a guard-on-guard ball screen to not be switched? Two, when two guys on ball, wide-open shooter. That's in what the, I'm saying. In when you're the most important about, moment. Right. That, that's critical. The biggest shot of the game. And it's, you're, you're in a guard-on-guard screen, and you're talking about – D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves. This isn't even a situation where you're talking about one of those two guys is like a Hall of Fame offensive right. talent. You really right. didn't want, you know, a certain guy on him and, and they miscommunicated. No, it, that's so obvious. It's Russell Reeves' ball screen. That's a switch every yeah. single time. Both guys go with the ball handle. It's one swing pass. Nobody within 10 feet of Austin Reeves. He squares up. 
has a wide open look on a night when he's feeling it and he gets a wide open look and knocks down. There was another play where he had a baseline drive for a layup when the ball was swung to him in the left corner and the, and the closeout was so ridiculously high that he, he just was given the baseline and the weak side help was unaware. It, these are, these are winning time. Yeah. It's winning time. This, this is, these are plays that have to be made. And then mm. offensively, some weird stuff. Okay. So one, I love the, the lob to Giannis at the end of regulation, okay, from the side out of bounds. Now, first, I want to say this. There's no question in my mind. Anthony Davis held the hell out of him. <laughs> held the hell out of him as he's trying to break – Giannis trying to break yeah. free to get a running start at the rim. I mean, AD had his arm all wrapped up. He had a hand around his waist. It's like, okay, whatever. I understand. You want to let guys play through in that situation. That was my era. I'm cool with it. Here's what I don't get about Giannis. Unless I'm missing something, he catches the ball perfectly thrown past by Middleton from from half court. Basically, he catches the ball at him for some reason. He caught it, and then he tried to scoop it like you know, like I said, scoop the ball upwards rather than just catch it and shoot a little short bank shot in a normal yeah. shooting. Run. I don't know why he chose to do that unless there was something where he just was completely off balance and he he was trying to regain balance in the air. I don't know what it was. But to me, that's a simple shot for him that should have gone yeah. down to end the game. It didn't yeah. happen. Now, go to his free throws. Two big ones, man. He missed two free throws late in that game that would have still – now, they might have still lost. But it was going to give them another chance, another possession right. to tie the game at the end that he basically took off the table because he missed two free throws. That reminded me of some issues Giannis had earlier in his career in that spot. Um, and then, look, some of these, some of these issues they had – with their offense, Anthony Davis, you know, the block he had on Lillard on the drive was one of the best defensive plays I've seen all year. And the reason is because if you look at the play, and hopefully we can maybe put this in after because I want people to see this. When, when Lillard drives down the left lane, Anthony Davis is basically engaged with Giannis under the rim. Yeah. If he times that too soon – and yep. he goes too soon, that is a lob dunk, and the game is over. He had to wait until Lillard was at a point of no return, which meant jumping off that foot, ball starting to go up to the shooting motion, and that's when Anthony Davis basically released from Giannis, took one step, and went straight up in the air and had to tip that ball at absolute peak of his jump to prevent that ball from going in, and then he secured the rebound on top of it. I just thought it was absolutely as good a block Outside of the Anthony Edwards block against Indiana, that's right. as good a block yeah. as you're going to see all year. So skip the Lakers some credit for what happened down Tons the stretch. But I also think the Bucks, the Bucks definitely contributed to their own demise. It's that that block you're talking about, Anthony Davis played 52 minutes last night. That you know, and that came a little bit before that, but that's a lot of minutes, and to be making that kind of play that late. And I love your point about going too early. That job, it's it's really a skill in the NBA, the big, when do you release? When do you stay back? When do you play? How do you fake that you go like Isaiah Hartenstein, Jokic, both of those guys are really good at, at the fake, you know, they'll yeah. step up and then step back and he, yeah. he, they get to in between and then you should throw something awkward. Anthony Davis just timed it perfectly knowing that. And he, if you look at it, he in freeze frame, he extends his arm as high as he possibly gets. Like he's doing a vertical jump test. He gets it and just gets enough of it at the very top. So an amazing play. A really special play for the Bucks. This team, I, they remind me of Dallas <clears throat> two weeks ago in that they show enough flashes that you watch them and go, okay, they're there. It's almost there. We're getting it. And then you get a night like this where they just lose to the shorthanded Lakers. So to me, I, I, I don't want to put too much stock into this one game, but it is one of those ones that you look at and scares you about this Bucks team. Um, no, there's no question about it. And I think I'm trying to find the reason I'm looking at my phone. I was given some a really interesting number this morning about the uh, Milwaukee Bucks in crunch time. Uh, here it is: Bucks in clutch time games before Doc. And I'm not trying to. This isn't an indictment on Doc, but it just tells you the state of their team because these are the reference points before Doc and after. That's how we're going to look at this team mm, all year. Yeah. The rest of the way, right? We are before Doc. They were 18 and six. In such games, they are five and seven now since Doc got there in the same exact kind of game. And the reason I do think it's worth talking about one, the Bucs had issues before they broke through and won a championship, right? And so right. some of those things I talked about surfaced last night. 
But Doc's had issues right. in big moments in the playoffs, man. It's it's part of it's just part of <clears throat> of his right his coaching career in the NBA. He's he's had issues in some game sevens. He's had issues with other situations within series, like pivotal points where they didn't handle things well late. It wasn't always him, by the way. I mean, think about some of the issues you have with Harden and Simmons and Philly. That, that's, I don't put that all on Doc Rivers, man. Like guys having mental breakdowns basically in the middle of the series. I don't, I don't put that all on him. But the, the stuff in, with the Clippers, yeah, a lot of that was. And so it's it's something that's going to follow Doc around. And so when every time they lose a close game, it's something else that kind of hangs in the air. And guess what? That means more questions about it. That means right. just that little seed of doubt. That's kind of floating in the air, and I saw a little bit of that last night. Because, look, as much as I've credited the Lakers for this win, these things aren't mutually exclusive, Adam. Both things right. can be true. This can be a great win for the Lakers and a horrible loss for the yep. Bucks. Like, yep. both things are true in this situation because there's just no way with a 19-point fourth quarter lead at home against <laughs> the Lakers without LeBron, you can lose the game. You just can't lose that game, whatever right. it takes. And yet, they did somehow. And yep. so – this is going to be interesting to see now. Does this mean anything to either of these teams going forward? I think it means more to the Lakers. I think the yep. Lakers, they're continuing to roll, right? And winning without <laughs> LeBron, that's a big confidence booster. For the Bucks. you know, I think it's a game they could probably put in their rearview mirror a little bit easier and try that to is. tighten up some of the mistakes they had down the stretch. And the Lakers, it gives them a three-game cushion over Houston. With 10 games to go, that's a really big cushion. You should be feeling pretty good about that. And then a two-game cushion over Golden State. So at least in the play-in, you're looking like you're going to host one round of games, which makes things slightly easier, which is big for them. Let's wrap up with the game. This might have been the most interesting game, so it's kind of funny that we hate, uh, saved it for last. The Thunder go into New Orleans and get a win over the Pelicans. They dominated them in the first half, built up a really big lead. The Pelicans were resilient. Stormed back in the third quarter, made this a close game in the fourth, but the Thunder were able to get it done in the clutch. What stood out to you about this one? Yeah, I, I think the fact that typically, um, as you said, you know, Thunder were in control of the game. Pelicans yeah. make a run. They're at home. Crowd was electric. You could feel it. They knew this was yeah. a big game. This was a big game, man. And you could feel that energy in the building. And a lot of times, man, when you've, when you've had the lead as a road team and you've controlled the game, and then you get hit with that surge – and they take the lead, very difficult to hold them off. And it was amazing the way Oklahoma City just got right back to neutral in the important moments and executed yep. exactly the way that they needed to um, down the stretch. So, look, they could they continue to be impressive. They You've got to give them all the credit in the world for the staying power that they've had. And this was a big win. Look, they, you know Brandon Ingram, I feel like every one of these games, you got to, you got to give the caveat. You know, yeah. teams are shorthanded, missing guys. Yeah. It's frustrating for all of us. Doesn't matter. That's a road win against a team that's playing really well against a particular player in Zion who's been playing great lately, and he was very good last night. And yet Oklahoma City is the team with all that youth. They're the team that handled themselves better in the last four minutes of the game to get this win. I don't think a team's ever seemed younger to me. I mean, Legs, part of this is I'm getting older, right? So the next generation of players keeps feeling younger and younger to me. But this Thunder team seems the youngest when you just see them interviewed and talk to them and everything else. But they are so freaking mature. And that win, you, you, were, you were kind of alluding to this. It's almost harder to win a game when you've blown a lead than it is to like come back or, or any of that stuff. They blew the lead and then just had that poise. And they had the poise because they have so many different guys they can go to down the stretch, including a guy I've been the hardest on when I've been talking thunder, and that's Josh Giddy. But last night, five of eight from three, and he shot them all with confidence. Teams are going under the screens, trying to leave him wide open. He gets 25 points, nine rebounds, four assists. To me, he's just their biggest X factor. In fact, he's the biggest X factor maybe of the Western Conference teams. But he still – I love that he shoots with confidence, and when he makes five of eight, you're probably going to lose. Totally agree with the X-Factor component. I actually think he and Dort kind of fit into one category as X-Factors in terms of number of made threes per game and the yeah. way their odds are going to increase if they're carrying their share of the burden because you're going to, you know those other two guys, the two star ball handlers, are going to get an awful lot of attention – uh, Chet Holmgren is is going to you know just do what he does pretty much every night. Those two guys, like the variation in the way that they play in their shot making, is dramatic. Um, looking at this last night to remind people if you didn't see the game, or remind people if you did, uh, CJ McCollum hits a hits a little floater with little over three minutes to go to go up five. So now this lead not only has been completely wiped out, it's beyond a one possession game. It's, you're down five now with three minutes to go on the road. 
What happens? Jalen Williams comes back, makes a really difficult drive, hits one off the glass. So one star does what he has to do. Come down, get a defensive rebound. CJ misses a three. Shea Gilgis Alexander hits a three. Next possession. Here we go. Tie game, minute and a half to go in the game. Um, after Shea Gilgis Alexander makes that shot. Then there's a turnover, come down, Dort's, Dort makes a three. So yep. in that period of time, a little over a minute, they go from losing the lead down five to immediately have they have restored it and they've taken a three-point lead in three possessions because of just their poise and how calm they are in those moments. And it stood out to me all year long. They just seem relaxed when other teams you know, kind of play a little bit frantic. They don't really do that, man. They, they, they're they very under control when they need to be, and they were again last night. Very in control. I want to go to the Pelican side because I actually thought the notes on them were a little bit more interesting. I mean, look, first of all, I don't want to take anything away from the Thunder. This was a big win. I Going into it, I thought this is a win for New Orleans. I wanted to see you know, the matchup with Big Val and Zion in particular against the you know a small, undersized front court in Oklahoma City. Guess what? Big Val didn't play in the second half. They had to end up kind of a, New Orleans adjust uh, rather than Oklahoma the other way around. But I want to go to the end of game. I always worry about teams' end of game. I'm just so zoned into it. We talked about the Mavs. They know what they're doing every end of game. They have all of the – not just their what action are we running, but every variable and every possibility off of it. I found the Pelicans' clutch time offense to be pretty um, simple. Like, it didn't seem like there was a lot layered on top of it. They had a couple sets they would run to. You got a lot of C.J. McCollum. But I just felt like down the down in the clutch, what New Orleans was running was something that I looked at and said, the ceiling on that is okay. It's not terrible. It's okay. And that's one thing that as we get towards the playoffs, we start to look at playoff matchups. That late game execution and how much dynamic offense do you create is going to be a big question. And watching them last night, I wasn't that impressed. I agree with that. And I think part of it is we have to be, you know, I have to understand that Brandon Ingram is an enormous part of yeah, that in those because moments, yeah. he can get a shot against anybody whenever he wants to. So you yeah. can run any action with Brandon Ingram, get him the ball, even if it's not perfectly executed, if you get some sort of switch or some sort of matchup, or even if you run something, they defend it perfectly, shot clock's at six, you got a 6'11 dude with a good handle and a lean back jumper. He can get off something quality whenever he wants to, and and you didn't have him, so that's a big deal. And C.J. McCollum had a rough shooting night, 8 for 24. That's actually his battle as aggressive as I've seen C.J. McCollum all year offensively as a scorer because I think he sensed that it was a big game. No yep. Brandon Ingram. A little bit more on his plate. So it was really he and Zion. Um, yep. you know, they, took, they took 41 shots. The rest of the starters uh, took 26. So right. th they they were clearly like, hey, this is about us tonight. This, we're a three-headed monster right. at the top. One of our guys is out. We have to do more. And unfortunately, Zion did his part, but CJ had a rough shooting night, which contributed to this. Trey Murphy continues to be one of my guys that yeah. I absolutely love. But 16 points last night, four of six from three, and he had a, one in the clutch as well, a catch and shoot. His game off the dribble, though, to me still has – there's a lot more to be untapped with him. And that's not a knock on him. It actually should be something that's exciting for Pelicans fans because there were moments – when I talk about their offense got a little – it wasn't very dynamic in the clutch. And you're right. Ingram brings a lot of that will make them more dynamic. But Trey Murphy, in theory, can be a guy that can grow into adding more of that. The way Chris Middleton adds an extra wrinkle to the Bucs, or at least did you know, in their heyday, I think that Trey Murphy can add that. He has a little off the dribble game, but you can tell he's not fully confident in it. He'll make a move, and if it doesn't work right away, he'll pull it out and reset. And to me, that's a big bottleneck for the Pelicans going forward is I think he can become a really good off the dribble player. He's just not there yet. Completely agree with you. Look, he's 23. That has to tighten up. It's it's gotten a little bit better. He's a little bit more confident in it. He's more than what he was when he came in the league in terms of other ways that he can score. But man, if he can add something where yeah. now he is more comfortable not not necessarily having to initiate offense, although that'd be great if he could if he could come off the floor, if he gets the outlet pass, whatever. And even if you're on the court with CJ and Zion and Ingram and he has the ball and come over and call Valanchunas over, call Larry Nance over, go create something great, man. If you get to that point, you got something special now with that many guys. Even if he doesn't get to that point, Adam, just get to the point where right. you can get the ball swung to you. A guy closes out on you aggressively to take away the catch and shoot three. And now you can go into a move 
and then maybe have one counter move if they cut you off to get right. something for yourself. That's the part of his game that he has to tighten up. And believe me, the, the way these guys add things to their games now in the offseason with related to their handle and ability to get shots off the dribble, right. I, I think that's doable for him. And if he can do that with the way he plays D and his catch and shoot um, threat, now, man, I think you look at the Pelicans differently. If you got a fourth best player that's that versatile offensively, because he's getting there, but it might be another year away. So this was a very impressive win for the Thunder, who are now just a half a game behind Denver. They've been neck and neck all year. They do have the tiebreaker over Denver by virtue of head-to-head -head matchup, which will help them out. They have a tough schedule, but legs. I've been doing this because I'm watching this standing like closely with the Nuggets. They they have, I think, the harder schedule between Minnesota, Denver, and Oklahoma City. They Oklahoma City has the hardest. But last night was one of those games I counted as a loss. When I just went through and said what's most likely to happen, last night's was a loss, and it's a win. The next one, tonight, they host, on a second night of a back-to-back, -back, they host the Rockets. Rockets will be the more rested team, but it is in Oklahoma City. If Oklahoma City gets this one, their odds of being the one seed skyrocket to me because I think this is another one of their really tough games. So I am really excited for that matchup. It's a big game for both teams because Houston, they're on this huge win streak, but they can't afford to lose even one game without losing pace with Golden State. So to me, that is the marquee matchup of tonight. I'm excited. So interesting that we're this late in the year and we're still talking about like number one seed in the conference, right? Yes. Yeah. You have a pretty good idea by now. We still have three teams. Any one yeah. of these three teams, although I think it's less likely for Minnesota, it's really I think it's more between Denver and Oklahoma City. There's only a game and a half difference between all three teams, but I just think with without Towns, it's just going to be harder for them. So it really yeah. comes down to Oklahoma City and Denver, and it's such an important piece because of what that means for matchups right down the road for these other teams that are trying to fight to get in or get out of the play in, or, you know, do you want to end up seven? You want to end up eight? Well, right. a lot of that's going to depend on where the nuggets fall. And so I know some of those teams like Dallas in particular, probably would like to have that little bit more resolution on that at the top to maybe yeah. strategize a little bit better. Cause certainly you want to avoid Denver as at all costs, as long as you can, you don't want to have to get them early, you right. know, give yourself an extra round before you get to the nuggets. Um, cause as much as we, you know, have been talking about the Mavericks today and as much as high as I've been on them now, since like mid February, um, we both agree that Denver is still the benchmark. Denver is the team and, right. and you know, they're going to be picked and favored to win it. So you got to avoid them as long as you can. So the fact that this might go down to the last few games of the season and those bottom teams don't know like, what that's going to mean. That's probably a little bit frustrating for them as well. Dallas might be lining themselves up for a perfect bracket right now. I mean, I don't know if they want to climb to that four or five. And then, as you mentioned, face up with Denver in the second round. Maybe you don't think that far down. But right now, sitting in the sixth seed, avoiding the play in, and then also yeah, being man. on the opposite side of Denver is it's, it would be a six, nice setup. You, you end up six. If this ends up as currently constituted, you end up six. You get yeah. Minnesota, a shorthanded Minnesota potentially in right. the first round. Then you get. A good Oklahoma City team, but a team with very little collective playoff experience at all. Right. I think I think Luca would be very happy to see that bracket laid out for him. You avoid, you know, even a team like the Clippers. You're avoiding. You're avoiding, yep. um, you know, any of those. Well, those teams are kind of a mess behind them, but they're still dangerous sure. teams. And it's, and certainly the most important, you avoid the Denver Nuggets. Yeah. Um, I said it was going to be the game of the night, Houston, Oklahoma City, and I think it will be. But we got a Woj bomb earlier this morning that Mitchell Robinson is available and active for tonight's Knicks-Raptors matchup. So he's obviously a big piece. I, I'm surprised that there wasn't more buildup to this. I knew there was a chance of him coming back, but this feels to me at least like it just popped out of nowhere that he'll be back and available to them. That's another piece for this Knicks team coming back together. You get OG and he'll be back here before too long, hopefully. I, who knows about Julius Randle, but even if you just get Mitchell Robinson and OG back, the Knicks are going to win the playoffs because of Jalen Brunson and because of defense, and you get another defender back. I think this is a big deal. It's a huge deal. You don't have to go any time on the court without a significant offensive rebounding presence, yep. without a significant big man in the middle defensive presence. That's yep. what Hartenstein and Robinson are going to give you collectively. And, you know, again, and like you said, Brunson controlling the game offensively. The way that he does, and they've had guys that you know have proven that can give you enough shooting, but you don't necessarily have to have big three-point shooting nights if you've got that right. level of defense and offensive rebounding. 
to, to give you second opportunities and to protect the paint the way they do. So it is a big deal. You're right. And it, I think the reason maybe it kind of snuck in on us, if they were playing the Celtics tonight, we would have been talking about this for the last 24 hours like because he's coming back. I think the fact that it's a Raptors, it, we're not as like tuned into that matchup, and he just kind of snuck in on us. Hey, Mitchell Robinson's coming back, but I agree with you. It's a big deal. And then I think the you mentioned Rockets. Thunder's huge, obviously. Suns Nuggets, man. And look. You excited? I'm excited. Here's why. Because I have been pounding the Phoenix yeah. Suns. I yeah. did it again this morning on TV. How yeah. can you not? Okay, they lost to a Spurs team that is not even trying to win without Wembenyama. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And they lost to the Bucs. We talked about that. Now you got the Nuggets on the road. So this is a chance to, I think, really firmly cement in people's minds that the Phoenix Suns are not a threat to anything this yeah. year. On the other hand, if they somehow win the damn game, and by the way, is everybody going for Denver? Everybody going tonight? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, actually, we don't know. We still we still don't have an update on Jamal Murray, but I suspect that they've been resting their guys the last six days or whatever it is to prepare for the stretch they have starting with tonight. All right. Well, the one thing that's been, that's been proven about the Suns here lately is uh, they're not going to stay necessarily like united so if you're denver this is an opportunity i think you come out and you try to hit them hard early in the game and see if you can fracture them if the suns win this game and the nuggets play well and they're at full strength it kind of just keeps stirring that conversation man well god look at all the talent they have they're dangerous that's why it's almost better if the nuggets just take care of business man and, and everybody can kind of be in the same mindset on the phoenix suns team because i those two games are very hard for me to forget the Milwaukee and the San Antonio game, just completely yeah. inexcusable. You also get Pacers Bulls tonight, which should be a really good one. And Warriors yep. Magic. Look, I don't expect the Warriors. It's always hard to do the two Miami or the two Florida games back to back, second night of a back to back. But you know what? The Warriors have no excuses. Tim Legler's not going to let you get an excuse for taking a back to back, so I'm not going to give him one either. That is your look ahead. That's just presented as always by DraftKings Sportsbook. A look ahead at tonight's games, which should be great. And that means that tomorrow's show should be great as well. Legs, another great show. Enjoyed it, man. Great stuff to talk about. Even better tomorrow. You can cue that outro music, Emma, and let us know we have a super chat today. I didn't even see it come through, so I missed it. LV Lambo says, at all NBA podcasters and Timmy Tim Legler equals cheat code. Great unbiased content. A 100 emoji. Oh, I'd love it. Thanks, Mom. Appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> who else is, gonna love, who else is gonna love on me like that besides family man i appreciate that somebody paid five dollars just to shout you out legs to shout us out i should say for the show everybody thanks so much for hanging out with us we're back tomorrow four days in a row it's kind of fun doing it four days in a row we're back tomorrow great slate we look forward to talking to it hit that like button on the way out we'll see you then Like the mayor.